So let's start uh, today's class. So today we are going to talk about uh, entity relationship modeling. So before talking about that, so this is what we talked last week. So we talked about the introduction to the database last time. So I briefly talked about history of database. And I mentioned that in the first part of our lecture, basically first half of our class, we are going to focus on relational database. So in the relational database, we briefly talked about the relational model what is the basic idea and how a relational model uh, works in the database system. And I talked about some advantage and also I mentioned some terms like PK for primary key, FK for foreign key, something like that. So that's what we covered last time. So basically in the relational model, we are structuring database like this. So there is a table which we also call as an entity. Uh, basically our data will be stored in the table. So that's what we talked about last time. And if there are multiple tables in the database, each store different type of information, these tables are somehow related to each other. So customer will make the order. So we have to make this relationship between customer table and the order table. So that's what we call as a relationship in the relational database. And what we talked about was this. So will there be any sophisticated way to model this kind of relationship before we actually implement a database system. So that's what we call as entity relationship modeling, uh, which we are going to talk about today, basically. So we are going to do entity relationship modeling uh, to design the database. So in database design, uh, we, uh, we kind of design database through the data modeling. And data modeling involves uh, using a formalized methodology to create a database design. And in relational database, when you model your, and when you design your database, there are two widely used methods. So basically, our goal is to design our database like this. And the first approach is utilizing entity relationship modeling. And entity relationship modeling is actually a top-down approach. So in the business, we have some kind of business event. And based on that, we are going to design the database system. So that's the entity relationship modeling. So it's a top-down approach, and it's suitable to structurally construct and design the database. So we are going to focus on the entity relationship modeling in our class. And there is another method, which is called normalization. So normalization is basically a bottom-up approach. So before database is introduced in the industry, people keep their data uh, in table format like this. So if you have used Microsoft Excel or any other spread uh, sheet program, then you are familiar with this probably. So basically all the data uh, will be uh, listed in a table format. And basically the bottom up approach, which is normalization, is from this. Let's just say that the company is not having any database system, but they kept all the data in an Excel file like this. Then they want to map this into the database system. So that's the normalization. So basically, in the table, they find that between uh, two different records, two, two different rows, whether there is any duplicate or redundant information. And if they find it, they make it a table into two different tables. So by doing that, they are able to uh, design the database system. So that's the normalization. Uh, but in this class, in this class uh, we are going to focus on the first approach, which is, is entity relationship modeling. So for normalization, uh, if we have some time left uh, at the end of the lecture uh, later, um, then I'll talk more about that. So database design, uh, basically we go through the three steps to design the database. The first one is a conceptual data modeling. Uh, basically, if you are thinking about making a house, it's just something like this. When you make a house, you are not going to build right away you are going to plan how to make your house first. So you are going to have some uh, conceptual design like this. You are thinking about what is your land, and you are thinking about how many rooms you want to have there, how many toilets you want to have there, and you want to have a general, like a general idea of how big your living room should be. So designing something like that, designing a house in a conceptual way, you first design and make a floor plan like this. That's something like a conceptual data modeling in the database system. So after you do conceptual data modeling, as your outcome, you are going to have this, which is we will call uh, entity relationship diagram. So basically today we are going to talk about how to 
do conceptual data modeling to make entity relationship diagram. So that's the first phase. And once you have a, a entity relationship diagram after conceptual data modeling, we are going to the second step, which is relational data modeling. So basically here, you are going to put more specific details of how your database should be designed. So it's something like this. Once you have a conceptual floor plan when you're building house, the next step is you are going to put exact measure. So how long your living room should be and how long your bathroom should be and which angle it should be located, something like that. So you are going to put detailed measure and you will know how your house should be implemented. So that's the same in database. In the relational data modeling phase, based on your entity relationship diagram, you are going to determine which attributes should be included in each table and what should be primary key, what should be foreign key, and you are also going to determine what's the data type of each element. So that's relational data modeling, and we are going to talk about that uh, in the next time, in the next class. So once you have a relational data model, then the last step is a physical implementation. So when you build a house, if you have this blueprint, you simply give this to the constructor, then they will build the house you want because all the information is here. They just need to follow all the details here and they build it. It's the same in the database system. Once you have this relational model, you simply give this to the computer scientist or software engineer, then they look at this and they will build database system. So, um, yeah, so that's it basically. So that's the basic steps of a database design. So today what we are going to focus is again entity relationship modeling, so let's talk about this. So basically this is the first step and first process to plan and create database. And once you do this, it will provide some conceptual blueprint for the database design. So once you have an EI diagram, everyone in a team and all the software engineers, they will have the same understanding of how your database should look like. So steps. So let's uh, go directly how to do entity relationship modeling. So the steps of entity relationship modeling will follow this. So first of all, you have to identify business event and its related business rules. And second, you have to derive entity relationship diagram from the business rules you inferred in the earlier step. And here in the second step, basically you are going to identify entity and attributes relationship and cardinality. So basically, this is the steps of doing entity relationship modeling, and let me go through one by one by giving you some examples so that you have understanding of how to do entity relationship modeling. So first of all, you have to identify business event in your firm. So basically, firm and organization, they will operate separate business. So it could be profitable business, it could be non-profit business, but anyway, there are many different businesses the firm is operating. And during this business process, they are collecting a data and you want to store that data in the database system. So the first thing you have to do is identifying business event. And the business event, uh, by definition, is a definable occurrence in a business scenario. So it can be a common high-level occurrence, such as a customer placing an order, also, it can be a more specialized event, such as a customer exceeding a credit limit while placing an order. So those are some of the examples of the business event. And other like examples you can see is here, basically a professor uh, teaching a course in the university, that's also a business event, because that's uh, what a university offers. And in the retail store, in the retail business, customer placing an order, and as you saw earlier, customer's order being rejected by exceeding a credit limit, those are another type of business event. So you have to identify those business events that you want to store data from it. And once you identify a business event, the next step is to identify the rules. So what kind of rules exist when business event is happening? So it's something like this. So you have a form, some kind of business scenario. From here, you infer business event. And from each business event, you have to infer business rules. And business rule is, by definition, a statement that imposes constraints on a specific aspect of a business event. 
So it can be from perspective of how the organization perceive and use its data. So when you infer business rule, it is always good to document it in writing. You know, like a word file or a certain file that all the employees or all the software engineers, they can access so that everyone has uh, the same understanding about the business rules. And it should be kept up to date. So identifying and documenting business rules are essential in database design because based on business rules, you are going to start uh, making the ER diagram. So let's uh, uh, give you one example, one very simple example. So let's just think about the university, and in the university there are multiple business events, and one of the uh, most common business events happening in the university is teaching. So let's just think about teaching in the university. So that's the business event there. And from this business event, let's just think about how we can infer the rules. So what kind of rules exist in terms of teaching in the university? So it's something like this. In the university, a professor may or may not teach in the semester. So there are multiple professors in the university, and some of them will teach in the semester, and some of them may not teach in the current semester. So it is not, uh, so the professor will teach in the semester, but it is not required that everyone should teach in every semester. So that could be one rule. And another rule can be this, when the professor teach, he or she may teach more than one course. So in a semester, when a professor is assigned to teach, he may teach more than one course, or he may teach just one course. So that's also possible. And another rule can be this, the co-teaching. So co-teaching is basically a teaching where a course is taught by more than one professor, and it can be allowed in some university, it cannot be allowed in some university. So in this case, we can assume that uh, in this specific case, co-teaching is not allowed. So we can identify business rules like this for every business event. So that's the first step. And once you have business rules, the next steps is actually quite straightforward. So the first of all, when you have a business event and when you have its related business rules, you have to identify entity. So entity by definition, is a component of data, and it can be any object in the system that we want to model and store information about a person, place, thing, or event. So anything we want store data and manage those data in our system, that's what we call as entity. So let's think about this. So earlier from the teaching in the university, we identified these business rules as you see here. So what kind of uh, thing can be entity here? So what kind of uh, component of data we want to store in our database system? So you can think like this. So professor, so basically teaching in a university is about professor teaching a course. So first of all, the professor can be entity. We need to store information about professor who is teaching. So that's the entity we can identify from these business rules. And the second is, basically, when the professor teach, he is teaching a course. So we also need to document and store and manage data and information about the course. So course can be another entity in this business rules. So basically, from this business event and its business related rules, uh, we are able to infer there can be two entities. One is a professor and the other is a course, like this. And in the Entity relationship diagram is basically a kind of a blueprint we are going to draw. And in the ER diagram, we are making this box to uh, represent the entity. So once we identify all the entity from our business event, the next step is identifying attribute. So basically, attribute is an item of information which is stored about an entity. So basically, we are defining what kind of attributes, what kind of characteristics of information we want to store about that entity. So for example, here we have a professor. Then we are thinking about uh, what kind of additional information we want to store about professor. So it can be, uh, it can be something like a staff ID. 
or it can be the name, or something like that. So there will be either information too. And for the course, it's the same. So what kind of detailed characteristics we want to store about the course? So for the course, we have a course ID, and we have the course uh, name or title, and like location and anything else like this. So basically, it's like this. So if you see in this guy diagram for a professor in our database system, we want to store information about staff ID, name, office information, email address, and the phone number. And for the course entity, the attributes can be course ID, course name, and the time of the course, and the location of the course. So these information are basically attributes we want to store about that entity. And in the ER diagram, we are representing attribute as a, a circle like this, and we make a line from the attribute to the entity to represent that this attribute belongs to that entity. So that was the, uh, basically how to identify attribute. And the next step is uh, identify primary key among the attribute. So in the last week, when I talked about the relational model, uh, one thing I mentioned is that every table must have a primary key. Basically, entity will become a table. So in the ER diagram, when we have an entity, and each, when each entity has multiple attributes, we should identify which attribute will become primary key. So primary key is, again, an attribute that uniquely identifies a record from another. And just like what I explained last time, every entity must have a primary key. And usually, these kind of identifier attribute can be a good candidate for a primary key. So like a staff ID, course ID, Hong Kong ID, user ID, customer number, those number, those ID exist, and it's very uniquely exist for every person. So that can be a good candidate for the primary key. And in the ER diagram, uh, for the primary key attribute, we usually utilize underline to represent the primary key. So when we have attribute like this, oops, uh, basically we are going to underline staff ID because staff ID is a primary key for a professor. And we are going to put underline for the course ID here to represent that course ID is a primary key for the course entity. So that's how we identify the primary key. So now, basically, uh, we are focusing on what kind of information we want to store in the database system. And the next step is a, a more complex one. So now we want to identify the relationship between entity. So basically, uh, before we talk about the relationship, we have to uh, first talk about what kind of relationship degree and relationship type exist in the uh, relational database. So relationship itself, by definition, is uh, that it illustrates an association between entity. And in the relational database, there are multiple degrees of relationship. The first one is a unary relationship. It's an association within a single entity. So basically, as you see here, an entity is related by itself. You can think uh, uh, one of the examples is this. If I give you some example, it can be like a marriage, basically. So example of a unary relationship is a marriage uh, because one person is associated with another person. Basically, person is entity in that case, and relationship is marriage. And second type, second degree of relationship is a binary relationship. In this case, two different entities are associated together uh, with the relationship. So it can be something like, it's a, one of the most common uh, degree of relationship, actually. Uh, something like a person. Mm, something like person uh, may have a, a car or something like that. Then it's a binary relationship. 
And the last degree of relationship that exists in the relational database is a tunnel relationship. Basically, uh, three entities or more entities are associated together. Then we call it tunnel relationship. So I'll give you more information, uh, more example about this later. But uh, it is also possible for the relationship to be associated with more than two entity. So there are three uh, types of relationship, and let me give you some example here. So the first one example is a unary relationship, basically. So uh, in the database system, let's just say that it's a government database system, and they want to uh, model the database system, which is able to store and manage information about the family. Basically, uh, there are multiple citizens, and they, the government want to keep the family tree of those citizens. Then how to represent a mother and child relationship? So something like a Susan is a mother of Tom. So to represent a mother and child relationship, so we have to think about first uh, what will be the entity. So basically mother and child, uh, from the government perspective, they are both a person, right? So we only need one entity in this case, which is a person entity. So first, uh, first we identify this entity and we have to think about what kind of attributes can, uh, that can exist for this entity. So when the government, when they want to uh, keep the information about the person, their citizen, uh, what kind of information they should keep? So for every person in Hong Kong, they have a Hong Kong ID. So the government, we want to record the Hong Kong ID for every person. And also, there will be name. And I mean, the date of birth, when they were born, that information the government will uh, store, and uh, the home address, and maybe phone number information, something like that. So these are basically an example of attributes for the person in this case. And then we have to identify what will be the primary key. In this case, it's quite obvious. The Hong Kong ID, which is a unique number for every person. So Hong Kong ID can be the primary key. So we put underline for the Hong Kong ID. And now you have to think about the relationship. Basically, the mother and child relationship is between person. So mother is a person, is a mother of another person. So we can uh, make this uh, unary relationship like this, basically, for this case. So basically, yeah, that's it. That's it. So that's an example of a unary relationship in the database system for the, this business event. So let's look at another one. So now let's look at the example of a binary relationship. So let's just say that we have this business event here, and here is the business rule. So a professor can apply for a parking permit in the university. Basically, it's about the parking event in the university. So here, there are two uh, things we want to make it an entity. The first one is a professor, so we want to keep the information about the professor. And the second is a parking permit, so we can also store information about the uh, parking permit. So for these two, we can make an entity. So we can make the professor entity to store professor information. And we can also make the parking permit entity to store uh, details of the permit information. So after identifying entities like this, we can identify the attributes. So for the professor, the database system, we can store staff ID. And also, we want to store the name about this professor and other information like an email. Uh, office or phone number, something like this. So this can be attribute. And for the parking permit, same. Uh, we can have the permit number stored in the permit entity. And also location of the parking space. And uh, the space or lot number. We can store that too. And then we have to identify the primary key. So for the professor entity, staff ID can be the primary key. For the permit entity, permit number, which uh, we can assign uniquely for each permit, then that can be the primary key. 
And then for the relationship, it's basically professor apply for parking permit, so we can make apply relationship, which connect professor and permit entity. So by, by the way, uh, in the ER diagram, the relationship is represented as this diamond diagram, and it can connect it with a different entity like this. So that's uh, one example of a binary relationship, basically. Okay, so let me go to the next one. So the next one is uh, cardinality. So once we define the degree of relationship, whether it can be unary, binary, or ternary, the next step is the, that we have to define the cardinality of this relationship. So the cardinality is basically about defining the minimum and maximum number of association uh, between entity. So it's about how many times one entity can be associated with another entity. So there are four main uh, cardinality type in the relational database. And let me explain uh, by giving you some example about this. So the first one is one mandatory. So one mandatory is basically the association, the number of association it can be associated with another entity is minimum one and maximum one. And uh, example is something like this. Um, No, can be. So something like, so yeah, the easy example is what we talked about earlier. So like a mother, basically. So how many mother you can have? So yeah, I'm talking about biological mother. <laughs> <laughs> so biologically, you can have only one mother, right? <laughs> Minimum one, maximum one, right? So basically, that's one mandatory. When there is connection, there should be existing record. So you can have only one mother minimum and maximum one mother too. So one and one. So in the database system, we represent that using this uh, one one uh, in the line basically. And the second is one optional. It, can, uh, it may not exist, but if it exists, it can exist to maximum one. So something like uh, um, maybe passport, right? So if you don't apply passport, you will not have it. So you have a zero passport. But if you apply for the passport, you have it. But you can have only one passport, something like that. So for that, uh, in the database system, we represent this with a zero and one like this. And the next one is many mandatory. So it's a minimum one, a maximum many. So in this case, you can represent this with a You can represent this with minimum one and maximum many. So in many, we can use this sign in the database system. And the last one is many optional. So you may have a, a zero and minimum and many at the maximum. So something like a car, which I uh, gave you as an example earlier. So if you don't have a car, you may have a zero car. If you have a many car, you can have a many cars. So that kind of information can be uh, recorded like this. So basically, that's the cardinality types and in the database system. Uh, based on minimum number of association and maximum number of association, we can have four different uh, cardinality. So actually, one thing I want to tell you is that in the relational database system, the maximum cardinality is actually more important. So minimum cardinality, it's actually less important because uh, when you implement it, um, you usually people don't give a restriction on the minimum cardinality. But the maximum cardinality, based on the maximum cardinality, the design of your database can be changed a lot. So which you are going to uh, see more in the future when I give more examples and, and when you do also assignment. But that's uh, something you have to note. So defining maximum cardinality is actually very important. So based on the four different uh, cardinality, uh, we can have uh, three different types of relationship. So basically, relationship type it's, uh, are determined based on the maximum cardinality on the entities associated together. So here is the example of a binary relationship, basically. In the case of a binary relationship, it's possible uh, one entity 
is linked with 1 and 1 and 1 and 1. Then in this case, the maximum cardinality here is 1, and also maximum cardinality here is 1. So in this case, we call this as a 1 to 1 relationship. And in another cases, it is possible one entity is related as a 1 and 1, so the maximum cardinality is 1 in this side. But in the other side, another entity can be associated with a maximum cardinality many. In this case, we call this as a 1 to many relationship. And the last one is straightforward. So both sides have a maximum cardinality of many. Then we call this as a many to many relationship. So these are important because based on the types of the uh, relationship, the database implementation can be changed. So let me give you some other uh, more examples here. So earlier we talked about this business event, uh, teaching in a university. So let's derive the relationship. Let's, uh, let me show you how we can actually derive the relationship from uh, this example. So earlier, from this teaching in a university business event, we identified the professor entity and the course entity. And we saved these attributes here for the professor and the course entity. And the relationship, this is pretty straightforward. Basically, professor is teaching a course. So we can identify teach relationship in the middle, and we can connect professor and the course entity together. So basically, professor will teach a course. So in the ER diagram, we can represent like this. So this is basically the binary relationship. So the degree of relationship is binary. And the next step is uh, identifying the cardinality. So how to identify cardinality? Uh, you have to think of another entity's perspective. So let's think from a professor's perspective. So from the perspective of professor, how many courses he can teach? So if you look at the business rule, he may or may not teach in the semester, right? So may or may not. So basically, it means that minimum he may teach zero course. And in the next uh, rule, it says that he, she may teach more than one course. So basically, based on this business rule, we can infer that the maximum cardinality will be many. So from the professor's perspective, how many courses can be associated is zero minimum and max many. So we can infer the cardinality like this. And now let's think from the course's perspective. So there is a course. How many professors can teach this course? So in this case, co-teaching is not allowed. So if there is a course, there should be minimum one professor who is teaching. But co-teaching is not allowed. So maximum, there should be one professor who is teaching. So we can assume that there should be only one and one professor teaching this course. So that's how you can identify the cardinality in the relationship. So in this case, basically, based on this example, we can infer that this is one to many binary relationship. So basically, that's the example of how to identify relationship. So this is a very simple example. If we have like a more business rules, basically, uh, the diagram can be more complex, which you are going to do in the assignment. OK, so let me go to the next slide. And, and uh, also, this example is uh, shown on the next slide, so you can check it. And also, when I go through it, if you have any question or if I go too fast, or then just uh, yeah, let me know. OK, so let me show you another example here. So let me show you the example of unary one-to-one -one relationship. So earlier, we talked about this uh, uh, representing mother-child relationship in the database. So earlier, what we made is that we made a person entity. And this person entity have a multiple attributes, which uh, I will skip. And it was person was related to another person as a mother. Oops. Uh, mother of relationship. So one person is a mother of another person. So that's what we made. So it was a unary relationship. And uh, we have to think about the cardinality. And before thinking about cardinality, let's uh, say that we have this rule, China's one-child policy. So uh, 
long time ago, there was a China, one, in China, there was a one-child policy uh, because there were too many people there and the government wanted to restrict uh, the birth of too many child. So given that there is a China's one-child policy, if we have to determine the cardinality, basically it will be like this. Uh, we can think from the mother's perspective. So let's think about the mother. So from the mother's perspective, how many child they can have? Uh, minimum zero. If they don't want to have any child, they may have zero child. And maximum, because of this one child policy, maximum child they can have will be one. So now let's think from the child's perspective, how many mother they can have? If there is a child, there should be one mother in minimum. And at maximum, they can have only one mother. So basically, the cardinality will be like this. So this is an example of a unary one-to-one -one relationship. So that's here. And let's go to the next example. So the same business event. So there is a person. And person can be a mother of another person. But in this case, let's assume that, uh, so now China's one child policy actually doesn't exist anymore. So they can have as many child as uh, they want. So given this business rule, if we infer the cardinality, it will be like this. So from the mother's perspective, how many child they can have? At minimum, still zero if they don't want to have any child. But in maximum, now because there is no one child policy, they can have many child. So it will be zero and many. And how about the child's perspective? It's just still the same. At minimum, they should have a, at least one mother. At maximum, still, they can have only one mother. So basically, this will be an example of a unary, a one-to-many relationship in this case. And let's think about this an example of a unary many-to-many -many relationship. So instead of a mother-child relationship, let's just say that we want to record simply parent-child relationship. So who is a parent and who is a child? Then in this case, still parent is a person, child is a person. So we still need only one entity to keep the information about parent and the child. And then we can make the relationship called the parent of. So one person is parent of another person. So let me skip the attributes. So there can be many attributes, but it will be the same basically. Uh, so let's think about the cardinality now. Let's say from the perspective of the parent. Oops. Parent. So parent is a perspective. How many child they can have? It's the same. So if I'm a par parent and if I have a child, uh, minimum zero, maximum many. So this part will be the same. And from the child's perspective, Let's just think about it. So how many uh, parents you can have as a child? Minimum is two, right? And the maximum, also two. So here, one thing you have to notice is this. In the relational database, when you record cardinality, they only concern zero, one, or many. So there are only three types. So two is not zero, it's not one. So it's more than one, then we consider this as many. Oh, but when you represent the minimum cardinality, yeah, you can only consider these two, basically. For the minimum cardinality, it can be other zero and one. And maximum cardinality, it can be uh, either one or many. So not this. Yeah. So in this case, it's two, so it's not zero, so you have to use uh, um, so I'm not familiar with this system. OK. So you have to use a 1 to represent it in the database system. So you can say that minimum is not 0. So at least there should be one record. And for the maximum cardinality, it's 2. It's not 0 or 1. So we can represent this as many, like this. So this uh, is how you can record cardinality in the ER diagram uh, for the relational database of this business event. So this will be basically an example of a unary, a many-to-many -many relationship. So to summarize, for the minimum cardinality, you have to choose between 0 or 1. So there can be 0 or none. And for the maximum cardinality, you have to choose between 1 and many.
Okay, so is there any question here? So this uh, this part might be a little bit confusing if, especially, it is your first time to uh, learn about the database system. Okay, I mean, if you get, uh, if you look at more examples and if you do more exercise, you can get more familiarized with this actually. So here's another example. So basically, it's about the uh, uh, parking permit example that I showed earlier. So earlier, for the professor applying for parking permit, we made a professor entity. And there is a apply relationship. So professor will apply a parking permit. And we made many attributes here, but let me skip that. So let's think about the cardinality. Let's say that our uh, university has this rule. So only one permit is allowed for each professor. Then we have to think about the cardinality from here first. So from the professor's perspective, how many permit they can have. Uh, if the professor doesn't want to apply for permit, permit, then they may have zero. And if a professor apply for a permit, the maximum permit he can have is one, basically. So it will be zero and one. And now here, you have to think from the permit perspective. So let's say that there is a permit. Then how many professors can have this permit? Minimum one and maximum one. So each permit can belong to only one professor. So that's how you can define. Oops. Yeah, that's how you can define the cardinality in this case. So this will be an example of a binary one-to-one -one relationship. So let's say that the university changed the rule. So they see that uh, many professors have more than one car. So uh, they say that now professor can apply for as many permits as they want. Then the cardinality should be updated. So we still have a professor and apply relationship and the permit entity here. And from the professor's perspective, now because they can have as many permits as they want, maximum they can have many permit, and minimum still zero if they don't want to have any permit. And from the permit perspective, it's just still the same. If there is a permit, it should belong to at least one and only one professor. So that will be example of a binary one-to-many relationship for this business event uh, based on this business rule. So the last example is a binary many-to-many -many relationship. Let's say that the university added one more rule. So they say that the parking space is not utilized uh, efficiently. So they made this rule saying that permit can be shared by multiple professor. So if one professor is using the parking space, he can use. And if when he's not using it, another professor can use it using the same permit. Then the entity is the same. So we have a professor entity and the permit entity, and we have apply relationship. So professor can apply for a parking permit. And here, well, this part is still the same. If profess from the professor's perspective, he can have a zero to many permit. And now here should be updated. From the permit's perspective, the permit should belong to at least one professor at minimum. However, it can be shared by many professor, so it can belong to many professor and maximum. So in this case, because of the maximum cardinality, of both sides of the relationship is many. We call this as a binary, uh, many-to-many -many relationship in this case. So that's the example of uh, all different types of relationship, basically. So let me talk about another type of relationship now. So. So, so far, the examples that I gave to you was a binary relationship and unary relationship. But earlier, I said that it's possible to have a ternary relationship, which means that a relationship has more than two entities associated together. So how we can infer that? So earlier, we used this example of teaching in the university, and we had these business rules. So at that time, we said that a professor may or may not teach in the current semester. And usually, in the university database system, we also keep the information about the semester. So we also have a, a semester entity 
and in that entity, we we'll keep information about how many students enrolled in that semester or something like that. So if we make a semester as a separate entity, uh, this relationship should be updated. So basically, it can be like uh, we can have the semester entity here, which has additional attributes. And basically, professor is teaching a course in a certain semester. So we can link this together here, like this. Then this teacher relationship will become the tonal relationship because now it's associated with more than two entity, basically three entity in this case. Then how to define cardinality? So this is a little bit, uh, you have to be a little bit careful. So defining cardinality in the tonal relationship, you have to think like this. So when we only have a professor and course, we think from the professor's perspective to determine cardinality here. And now to determine cardinality here, we have to think from the professor and semester perspective together. What it means is that there is a professor in a certain semester. How many courses did he teach? So professor in a certain semester may not teach anything than zero minimum. And a professor in a certain semester may teach many courses. So maximum many like this. So same here, there is a course in a certain semester. How many professors can teach that course? Only one and one. So these two are same, basically. And now here, we have to think from the a professor who teach a course. So professor is teaching a certain course. How many semesters he can do? Um, he can teach many semester, or uh, maybe he has not teach yet, something like that, then it will be zero. So minimum zero, maximum many. So this minimum cardinality, it can be one, two. It doesn't matter in this case. It's based on the business rule, basically. So yeah, here is basically the sample solution for uh, the tonal relationship based on these business rules. So we will continue to talk about conceptual data modeling. So earlier, this is what we talked earlier. So teaching in a university, we can have a three entity, and we can determine relationship and relationship type and the cardinality like this. So, and usually in the database system, in addition to those simple attributes, Sometimes we want to record more advanced information, something like this. Um, the number of courses offered in a university, something like this. So why this is uh, different from the attribute I talked earlier? It's because of this. Uh, this is an aggregated field. Basically, to calculate this information, like the total number of something, we have to utilize some kind of a mathematic uh, formula. So we have to count, or we have to sum up, or we have to make average. So that's what we call as an aggregated field. Basically, it's the calculated field. So let's assume that we want to store this information, like the total number of courses offered in a given semester, total number of courses offered by each professor, and total number of courses offered by each professor in a given semester, something like this. To know this number, we have to look at our data and we have to calculate the information. So basically, to know the total number of courses offered in a given semester, we have to search database and we have to understand how many courses offered in each semester. Same for this. So for each professor, we have to count how many courses were offered. And for each professor in a given semester, we have to count how many courses were offered. So for aggregated field, uh, where we can record this information. So first of all, what you think is this. So after you make a year diagram based on all the simple and basic attributes, uh, for aggregated field, you can think it later at the last step. So aggregated field, after you design the year diagram, now you think where this information can be stored in your database system. And when you think about this kind of aggregated information, Let's look at this example, total number of courses offered in a given semester. Um, yeah. Do not think about how this information is calculated. 
So that's uh, not necessary. You have to think about where this information depends. So for the total number of course job folder in a given semester. So basically, for every semester, you will have this information. So you have to think about it in this way. So basically, there will be semester uh, 2021 T1, 2022 T1, something like that. And then you will have this uh, information. So it depends on, so this information basically depends on semester. So that's the dependency. So you have to think about the dependency where this information depends on. So this total number depends on the semester. So semester entity is here. So basically we can add this aggregate information here, like this. So we can add total number of courses per semester into semester entity. So yeah, so uh, usually when I put aggregated field in the ER diagram, I put this uh, uh, asterisk sign, but uh, it's not necessary. Some people ask uh, uh, why I put this, but it's just uh, my habit to let you know that this is an aggregated field. So that's not necessary, but it's there. So let's look at the next one, the total number of courses offered by each professor. So basically for each professor, we have this number. So the dependency is on professor. So we have a professor entity here. So for the total number of courses offered by each professor since he joined, will be added into professor entity like this. And the next one is this. Total number of courses offered by each professor in a given semester. So every semester, every professor teaches different number of courses and we want to record that information. Then now it depends on two things. For a certain semester, for a certain professor, we want to know this information. So it depends on semester and professor. However, um, currently we don't have uh, that place to store this information because uh, this teach relationship is here, but teach relationship is a tonal relationship. It depends on semester, course, and professor. It does not just depend on semester and course. So to store this information, what we can do is this. We can make the relationship here connecting professor and semester. So for each professor, they can teach across many semester. For each semester, there could be many professors. So we can design many-to-many -many relationship like this. And here, because it's a many-to-many -many relationship, it, has a, it contains assignment information, and it can be a table when we implement it. So we can add this aggregate attribute here as an attribute of this many-to-many -many relationship like this. So here, the point is this. When you add aggregated field, into ER diagram if there is no location for that. But if it depends on uh, more than one entity, you can create that relationship. You can create many to many relationship to store aggregated field. So that was the key point here. So another uh, useful entity many people utilize in the database system is a time entity. So sometimes uh, in the like, uh, financial system, uh, it is very important to keep the time, uh, like a time related information. So basically time entity is an entity which represents time specific information like a year, month, day. And usually in the financial system, we commonly store like a yearly sales, monthly sales, or something like that. So if you want to store those information in the database system, you have to create time entity. So um, if you need to store aggregated information like that, then you can create year entity to store yearly information, month entities to store monthly information, and also date entity to store uh, daily information like this. Then the example is this. Maybe we want to store the total number of courses offered by each professor, not every semester, but in a given year. So, in every year, we want to store how many courses were taught by each professor. Then, currently, we don't have any time entity here, but we need year time entity, so we can create. So we can create uh, here like a year. Time entity with a year as the primary key. 
And then we can connect this with the professor table. So in each year, there are many professors teaching. In, for each professor, they are teaching across many different years. So we can make that. And in this many-to-many -many relationship, we can add uh, this here. Total number of courses offered by each professor in a given year. And the second, the total number of courses offered in a given year. So uh, basically, this information will be summing up all the courses taught by different professor. So every year, we want to know how many courses were offered in this university. So for this information, we can simply save it in the year entity. Because year entity contains year information, for each year, we want to have this aggregated attrib attribute here, basically. So that's how you can add uh, aggregated field with a time entity in the year diagram. So like this, yeah. The last thing about things is this. So basically, earlier when I talk about the year diagram, uh, we I mentioned that from the business like a form, you have to identify multiple business events, and for each business event, you infer the rules, and then you make a year diagram. So what it means is that in, a, in the same form, there could be multiple business events, and for each business event, you have a one year diagram. So that means that you have a multiple different uh, business events, and multiple year diagram too. So the last step you can do is uh, making an integrated year diagram, basically, it's the final blueprint of the entire database design inside your firm or organization. So what you do in this step is basically you put all the ER diagram you have made so far, and you try to find the related sets of ER diagram from multiple business events. So in a firm, there are multiple business events. For each business event, you create the different ER diagram like this, and then you combine this together into one big picture like this then you will have the entire database design for your form. So how you can do? The simple example is this. So let's say that uh, in the university, you made this ER diagram for a professor apply for parking permit. And also, let's say that you made this ER diagram for teaching in university. So we have two business events as an example, and we made two ER diagram for each business event. And if we want to make an integrated ER diagram, basically we have to find something common between these two. Here, something common is basically professor entity. So it's here, it's here, it's the same entity with the same attributes. So we can put this together. In the database system, you don't need to make two separate professor entity because they are the same thing. You only make one professor entity and you are going to combine these together. So the integrated ER diagram will look like this. Basically, putting professor, which is the common in these two diagram, and then you put the rest of them here and here. So that will be integrated ER diagram, uh, given that there are two business events like this in the university. 